um, I uh, would like to announce this so very um, educated session today on convalescent plasma therapy for COVID-19 patients. We have had several discussions uh, um, about this, but we, you know, something new is emerging. And uh, today we are just uh, compiling everything that you know we've talked about, and we have. Um, out more about it and we also have three committees of API working uh, in this regard. So our moderators today, uh, Dr. Madhavi Gorusu, President of Connecticut PI, and uh, Dr. Rupert Parikh, uh, Executive Director of Advanced Rehab Care and also President of uh, API YPS, will uh, now take over and introduce our... Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Arora. Thank you. Uh, and uh, welcome everyone, and uh, my uh, great honor to welcome the esteemed speakers. And uh, I have done quite few of these uh, sessions, but uh, I have never had the honor of uh, moderating a session where um, a hero, a recovered patient, and uh, a donor who has donated the plasma for this great purpose were on the same virtual podium. And I'm so blessed and to honored to have such a wonderful speaker panel. And um, look at these stalwarts, right? Dr. Bruce Sachais, Dr. Paniko, uh, the Dr. Kumar who will be joining us. So it's a great honor. Welcome. Um, and um, as a part of the routine disclaimer during the API uh, uh, of the webinars, this is an educational purpose and kind of more of a journey of what API has done and what is happening in the world of this pandemic when we have all learned uh, on the go and helped each other. So but this is by no means API takes any kind of responsibility for the content or the validity part. Each own physician should be the one who would be um, informing them of the right medical treatment. So that I have to do the disclaimer. Uh, Dr. Suresh Reddy, the president of API, when he suggested that we should be conducting a summit on the plasma therapy part. And uh, when I was uh, in the last between end of March, early April to now, the tremendous effort that API has done, be it in support to the patient families or uh, lending their strong voice to the legislation to help not only their physician uh, uh, colleagues, in fact, who were patients uh, fighting this battle against the uh, deadly virus and supporting the patient families who were at that time, we didn't have like what Dr. Sachais will be talking to us later, that now I do not think I have been approached by any patient family asking me to help them to connect them for directed donations. But during those times when things were so uh, uh, uncertain that what our role API has played and when Dr. Suresh Reddy wanted to kind of consolidate all this in a summit and when I was looking for who would be the speakers uh, me being part of Hartford Healthcare, I was amazed by the great leadership, the frontline workers, of course, including me, but people like Dr. Paniko who were in the intensive care unit helping their patients, and the leadership like Dr. Kumar, who has done a tremendous job with their team in making sure that things are implemented way, way ahead of many other institutions. So I said, like, who more? Uh, I can get these wonderful speakers too. And then um, during all this, I have to tell you that um, when we were trying to get uh, patient families supported with the plasma, I was amazed by the entrepreneurship and so ahead of the game that the New York Blood Center was. And uh, I'm truly, truly grateful for what they have done to the community because our own patients in the New England area when they were at that time trying to go to uh, Rhode Island, a blood center. And those initial days, I have heard firsthand information that it was in fact the extra units that the New York blood center was able to share it with them. So thank you so much, Dr. Sachais, for all what you have done to the patients and the families. So uh, having said that, uh, Dr. Kumar, are you on? I'm on, can you hear me? 
Yes, hi, Ajay. Welcome. Excellent. Thank you. I'm sorry I was uh, a little difficulty in getting on, but I'm on now. Thank you. So. Sure, sure, sure. So let me introduce um, uh, Dr. Kumar. Uh, Dr. Kumar is our Senior Executive Vice President at Hartford Healthcare, and uh, he is our Chief Clinical Officer, and I can keep going on and on for another five minutes at least to tell about all the remarkable achievements and what a role model Ajay is for many, including me. And offline, I can tell you that he was my uh, one of the pillars when I did my MBA. So all the good tips that he gave me made me survive um, uh, the MBA program. So uh, Ajay, thank you so much for being here. So let me start the session. Um, thank you. Um, so uh, Ajay, so uh, if I may ask you, uh, the first question I would like to uh, kind of go with the format is can you please share your thoughts as a leader of this major healthcare organization, Hartford Healthcare? What were your challenges, steps you have taken to guide your team, implement plans to face the pandemic? And before you please start, I would like you to please take yourself a bit back in the timeline, specifically to around late March and early April this year when FDA has approved uh, with collaboration with Mayo Clinic to roll out the EAP protocols using convalescent plasma therapy to the patients. Please share your thoughts. Thank you. I appreciate it, Madhavi. Thank you very much. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll go actually get a little further down uh, in January. So as my role as a chief clinical officer, um, um, I became, uh, I was appointed in this role in September last year. So uh, I was just still trying to find my feet in this role. And uh, this unprecedented, um, pandemic which came upon us um, really created new challenges. Quite frankly, I learned uh, through the process more than I've, uh, um, uh, more than I imagined. Um, back in January, when we started noticing what was going on in China. Um, we started paying attention from the heart from healthcare perspective that um, how, do we, how do we respond if it comes to our doorstep? Frankly, initially my reaction was that we have a standard work. We have been doing this kind of work in communicable disease for a while, so we should be able to manage this without much of a hassle. Quite frankly, I was very wrong. Um, in Feb of uh, this year, we started uh, organizing a team. So my focus was uh, containment and as much as education and uh, trying to prepare the resources at that time. Uh, in March, actually, we created this incident command center. And just to give you a perspective, Hartford Healthcare has seven hospitals. Uh, it has about 32% market share in Connecticut. It's the second largest healthcare system in Connecticut and it's one of the top 10 in the Northeast region. Uh, we have a 400 access points that's defined by the urgent care, primary healthcare centers and hospitals and other areas. We, are, uh, we have a large home care component in that and three nursing homes are still living. So you can imagine that our challenges were diverse in pretty much every single aspect of your um, continuum of care, you can imagine, we were um, exposed to a certain extent to have an entry of this virus to our kind of ecosystem. So initially it was a um, lot of training to frontline staff and making sure that the individuals understand what needs to be done, how do you manage the PPE and how do you understand the disease of recognition and trying to understand this disease which is evolving in its nature and quite frankly, the science in itself. Uh, um, you know, we created multiple teams initially, the response was uh, focused on how do you prepare the search capacity within the system, how do you retrain, recruit, and redeploy our employees. Uh, our focus was not to really furlough anybody because we felt that this is the time the community needs us and the heart for healthcare has been in strong uh, financial performance for a while, so we wanted to make sure we continue to leverage that capability in the organization. Um, we focused on retraining and redeployment the employees quite a bit, and that, that really helped us quite, uh, very well. Resource, especially in the PPE, ventilators, high flow oxygen devices, and uh, um, medications such as Amdesivir and uh, Tofismab and other medications, we needed to make sure we have a, a stockpile. Frankly, at one point, we did have a stockpile of hydroxychloroquine as well, um, till we realized it was not the right thing to do. Um, so in this journey, one of the challenges we had was the convalescent plasma. Initially, we had applied for Mayo Clinic's uh, participation. And for some reason, um, we were not selected. I was dismayed and surprised at the time. So um, we had, a, I remember, a seven in the morning urgent meeting try to make this available for our system. Um, at that time, uh, New York had a capability of delivering that and um, our Connecticut birth sensors right across really was trying to establish how do you create the collection centers. 
uh, and we we started working with New York Blood Centers and Rhode Island Blood Center at the time. And um, you know, I saw Chris on the online here, and Chris happened to be one of the first donor. Our organization in the uh, COVID front um, evolved in um, not just the capacity management, the resource utilization, uh, focused on the clinical science evolution. We created a toolkit of how we're going to work as a system, working on several policies and re-evolving the policies, quite frankly, very regularly, about visitor ban, um, uh, uh, um, a screening process, and making sure that we stay ahead of the curve. I also created a kind of informal network with some of the members across the country. Um, I happen to have some, um, at his friends, I would call them now, working in Hopkins and Mayo and uh, Freedom Clinic partners, Presby and, uh, and partners. Um, and I was able to connect this informal network of colleagues actually to make sure we stay ahead of the current and we bring the best science and technology. Soon enough in the journey, I realized that um, Madhvi can stop me anytime. I can go on and on uh, as much as you like. You're good. Please uh, continue. Would, uh, okay. Soon enough, realized that um, the science was still evolving, and we need to um, really um, make sure that we have testing capabilities are optimized. Uh, we have uh, appropriate people utilization, and I can tell you the stories. We actually positioned four people in China to secure a supply chain effort. In three in the morning, we had calls to make sure that the shipment was held by Chinese custom because for whatever the reason, the political reasons, uh, they were not able to deliver, or we were on the call to make sure we actually get the supplies um, to, to the community. We had, uh, we never ran out of the supply. We actually made the universal mask policy somewhat early in the stage or across the healthcare system. It was important for us to make sure we connect with the community. I think we are here to serve the people. Uh, we started a call center very early on, um, uh, 24 hours, and we had infection disease and nursing uh, individuals position at one 24 hour period. I remember sometime in March, we had a 6,000 calls come to our call center. Our call center was one of the first one in Connecticut to be established. Uh, and we actually got calls from Montana, Texas, California, and this call center. Our call center still exists. Uh, and we made sure that we reached out to the community. We started writing the media briefing because a lot of misinformation was coming out and be able to present and connect with the community as well. So during this journey, we evolved from containment effort to making sure we share the knowledge, we share our toolkit with the rest of the state. I was fortunate enough to lead the state CMO's uh, task force on Connecticut to work with them and share the best practices we were developing and uh, with everybody else as well. During along the line, I was realized that one of the most vulnerable population was a nursing home and assisted living. That's a reference I made earlier on. We created a task force in, I believe it was uh, somewhere around mid-March uh, of entire state's nest, um, nursing home and assisted living. And we had a regular meeting on a weekly basis to make sure they understand the PP utilization, how do you get a COVID only unit? How do you make sure you train your employee? How do you put the screening process in place? And how do you make sure infection prevention expertise are available because not every single nursing home in the Connecticut actually has that capability. And we shared our teams uh, um, uh, on that platform. We also uh, knew that uh, this is not enough. We actually connect with the electro emergency medicine uh, services as well. And EMS providers were taught and trained in our uh, simulation center. How do you actually transfer a patient from a a simple thing like that, how you make sure safely you transfer from nursing home or any other place to, uh, to the acute facility. And how do you create a communication channel that the triage is happening the right way and the patients is escorted in the appropriate way. So it was a multifactorial, it was almost a warlike operation. Pretty much every single day meeting, every single day teams were created and dissolved to a certain extent the task was done. And we worked in a very agile fashion to make sure that we could stay on top of that. During this journey, I realized that one of the toll is going to take on the clinicians. And I remember having a regular meeting with our critical care physicians, emergency physicians, our anesthesia, our um, nursing teams uh, across the system. And I was personally involved in making sure I connect with everybody. Uh, we want to make sure that we have how they're dealing with a disease, what effect they're having. I remember at the time I, 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 I was um, visiting one of the critical care, and I realized the nurse actually had gone through four different conversations with the patients not doing very well and some of them are dying and connect with the families because the visitation was restricted at the time and the emotional toll it was taking on this nurse was unbearable. So we created a, um, make sure that we actually um, have some sort of a technology such as Zoom or whatever else, the iPads distribution across the ICU, but it was not enough. It's important to realize that the caregiver who's on the front line, they're struggling. Their emotional um, trauma uh, sustained is quite significant. So I wanted to really create a individual team actually who connect with the family and not involve critical care physicians and nurses because let them be detached from that 
emotional trauma as much as possible. I think I was partially successful in making that happen, but we tried to that level. Soon enough, we realized that this is actually, it's going to lead to a PTSD among the, our community. It, this COVID disease is not a, just a disease. It's, it's a really a, um, a really different type of animal we were dealing with. It has a psychological toll. It has emotional toll, socioeconomic tolls. Many of the colleagues across the Hartford Healthcare and the community as well, their loved ones had lost their jobs. They were struggling, the isolation, their loved ones were dying. Um, so there was a different type of uh, pandemic we were getting ready for. So we converted our call center to what we call as a community care center. Now we provide a mental health consultation uh, and we are making sure to connect with our behavioral health network. Uh, we are fortunate to have one of the larger, uh, largest behavioral health network across in the Eastern uh, Seaboard as well. Um, so right now, um, that's our focus to make sure our teams are supported. We have our wellness department making sure connecting with Zoom calls and providing therapy. And we've had concerns about some of the clinicians and nursing who had been quite depressed and one or two have been suicidal as well during this process. So this pandemic has taken the toll, not just from the science perspective, economic perspective, management of our workforce, but it, has a, um, it, it is going to have a lingering impact on the community. So this entire process, which I just described, required our entire cabinet of eight members working day and night, every single day, to make sure we manage the aspect of employee management, the clinical science, the team deployment, the capacity management, creating excess capacity, working with National Guard, we erected a 628-bed convention center um, um, hospital. Um, so um, one of the reasons, uh, later in the stage, um, testing was a challenge for us. We were able to um, uh, really um, stand up a effective rapid testing uh, platform, which uh, uh, was a challenge for us. And we realized that testing was not a core capability in the Harper Healthcare possessed. We didn't have that, um, um, that level of lab system. So we really worked with Quest and created a new type of partnership. I worked with Jackson Lab to have a contract with them to be able to support our people. And initially, the data has emerged that there was a significant effect on the diversity, how uh, the low socioeconomic status and individuals in uh, different backgrounds were affected um, more than other. Uh, we wanted to do something different at the time. So we were the only organization in the state of Connecticut. We actually connected with the churches. Uh, we went to the halfway houses, covenant centers. We offered testing to individuals. We made sure our, uh, our teams in Brownstones connect with those individuals who does not have a primary care, who does not have anybody to take care. So um, our community care center in Hartford Hospital is working on making sure that we continue to follow the, uh, those individuals who were affected by COVID. And obviously, um, recently, in the last several weeks, we've seen a different part of our world um, changing with a, um, a, a significant dialogue regarding the racial inequality. Uh, and this has compounded the effect on that itself. So our journey continues. COVID was one example to really show the underbelly of our society to a certain way. Now we have to react differently. So it's been an interesting journey in several months, and I think I, I, I couldn't be proud of the colleagues when I worked in Harper Healthcare, uh, from our critical care physicians to our nurses to our emergency physicians, EMS providers to our dietary individuals, the person who cleans the room. Uh, and mind you, we had to create a 300 page of policy manual, uh, how to respond to the level of how a, a, a person who, who's passing a tray needs to be managed. How do we make sure the exposure of the number of people entering the rooms is managed. How do we convert our ICUs to have the, all the devices out and how do we roll it out across the system? How do we make sure we load level the patient load across the system through our transfer center to make sure the one hospital doesn't get overburdened? And during this time, we were actually able to secure more ventilators. We were able to secure high flow de devices. And we also um, made sure that we, we actually supported our one of the smaller hospitals, uh, which is not affiliated to the Hartford Healthcare I remember getting a call on Friday, a Sunday afternoon that they were running out of the ventilator and they had significant high demand for that. Within two hours, we shipped 11 of our ventilators to their doorstep. Um, uh, we haven't got them back yet, but we will hopefully get them back. Later on, we actually, they wanted some people. So we actually sent 11 of our nurses as well. I'm sorry, eight ventilators and 11 of nurses as well. So we will support other community as well. So all in all, um, it's difficult to define what the success looks like of any healthcare system responding to COVID. You know, I have a few metrics I think about all the time. Our mortality in heart for healthcare is about 25% at the moment for inpatient hospitalization, uh, which is not great. Um, it's, it's a high mortality. However, it is better than when you compare it to New York or any of the um, um, hotspots area. 
uh, 712 of our colleagues among 30,000 people who are employed and work in hardware healthcare during this time period have been infected with COVID. Um, that is a 2% rate of our colleagues in cumulative uh, number. Our rate of infection is declining. We have created a hotspot. So every single day I get a report which part of the organization actually has a possible hotspot happening. So one or two individuals got affected. We have a SWAT team who work make sure we talk about social distancing, cleaning effort, and all that kind of stuff. So we are coming out, uh, in my opinion, in a new normal, stronger than before. We are coming out and learning a lot more things what we did not know about ourselves, quite frankly. Um, so this pandemic has been an interesting journey. Uh, and I think um, putting this uh, conversation together with all the members to share our knowledge and share experience is a, is a wonderful way of um, sharing our experiences. So I'm going to stop here, Madhvi. Otherwise Thanks, you'll Dr. Kumar. Dr. Kumar, I, I know the in the interest of time, just say a word or two about the donor plasma registry, given that we are focusing yeah. on the plasma summit, because that Thank has you. been, I know the nurses who are donating, so please share that. Yeah, so we, we created a, um, a, a focused uh, effort. We actually deployed people to make sure that there is a Every single individual who've been positive, at least in heart for healthcare, it's a touch point that they're connecting back. We're making sure there's a process in place that the individuals get the information about what needs to be done. They're tested negative and they're primed for a donor, a donor pool. So far we have, um, I think 476 plasma collected as of yesterday, and we have transferred 350 people in heart for healthcare. So I just registry is managed by our uh, blood bank individuals. We have a dedicated resource and we were making sure that we, um, we remain uh, part of that. During this journey, I forgot to mention, the Mayo actually reached out to us because one of the, we are one of the highest, uh, apparently, I did not know that, one of the highest uh, plasma uh, activity uh, hospitals. So we, we were invited to be part of the study um, along the journey as well. So now we are participating with Mayo at this, this as well. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Thank Kumar. That was great. Uh, so uh, thank you so much. Let me now move to our uh, next speaker, Dr. Paniko, who is our um, critical care um, in intensivist, and she is the uh, director of the respiratory therapy at the Gaylord Center. And she, amongst our other uh, intensivist uh, colleagues, have been at the uh, forefront helping patients. So, um, uh, dear Megan, dear Dr. Paniko, welcome and thank you so much for being our speaker. Um, let me uh, please uh, pose the first uh, question to you. Dr. Paniko, you have been one of our frontline warriors and as an intensivist. Can you share your experience when you were looking for options, how best to help your patients uh, what were your thoughts about use of plasma therapy when FDA approved the clinical trials and you were one of the core team who has firsthand implemented this supportive treatment to your patients? Dr. Paniko, please. Thank you, Dr. Garusa. Um, yes, I can definitely speak to the plasma side of things. Um, as a critical care team, we were very excited to have this as an option. Um, we had been taking care of patients by the time that we were able to use plasma for about a month at this point in time um, and we didn't know where things were at. Um, most of our initial patients who had presented were still uh, critically ill in the hospital. They had now been intubated for two, three, some four at this point in time. We had treated them with the hospital that had already evolved significantly from intubating people on arrival who hit six liters of oxygen to transitioning to trying to keep them on high flow as long as possible for intubating them to not using steroids because the mortality was higher that of the initial data that we were getting out of china to transitioning to using steroids before any of the data came out really that we should use it and i'm happy to say that it sounds like we've been validated over the last couple of days that steroids do make a difference um, but despite that, you know, we were giving people hydroxychloroquine, we were giving people azithromycin that didn't turn out to probably be helpful. We were giving people tocilizumab, which did seem to have an effect, but we still had this group of people who were, for all intents and purposes, pretty healthy people yeah. who had now had their lives completely taken away from them, had been critically ill longer 
than most patients are. Um, we often know that the process in the ICU is that people often define themselves within the first couple of weeks. And what was happening with these patients is that they were staying critically ill. They weren't getting worse. They weren't dying, but they weren't getting better. And we didn't have anything else to give them. And so when plasma became an option, we were very excited about it. Um, we first used it with patients that had been there for a long time. And so we weren't sure what was going to happen with it. Um, but anecdotally, it seemed that after we gave them plasma, um, they were given two units um, of plasma that we did see improvement. And obviously it was combined with other treatments, um, but these were patients that we'd been waiting and waiting and just seeing if they would finally turn around. And we did start to see them turn around. Um, our process evolved throughout um, as it's become more readily available to us. Um, and when we started using it and the impact that it's had on patients, I think has become greater over time because we've been able to use it earlier in the course. Um, and we've been able to use it with really anyone that needs it. We were very restricted in the beginning, um, basically due to access. And now any patient that comes into our hospital that fits criteria, we can give plasma to and we give it very early. Dr. Paniko, can you also share at uh, the initial rollout of these protocols, I believe there was a differentiation between um, uh, who gets these. There were th different types of protocols, acutely ill, moderate, and um, uh, those. And now it is, as you said in your last statement, you are giving to whoever are the uh, criteria. But can you share um, light about uh, your experiences with if you can differentiate in the different clinical subcategories, and even if you can share, have you had an experience where a healthcare provider or somebody was exposed and have you tried those? Because I believe Hopkins has a clinical trial in patients who have been exposed to the role of giving the plasma, please. So it, as I said, it has definitely evolved throughout the process um, for us initially, when we rolled this out, um, our initial cases um, were from a patient you're gonna hear from very soon, who we all strongly believe that this made a difference in him. Um, but what I think what we realized uh, going forward is that we needed to look sooner. This needed to become something that we thought about when the patient hit the emergency room door, when the patient hit the floor, when their respiratory failure was starting, not when we were intubating the patients. Um, this is a treatment that hopefully will present, prevent them from getting the secondary, secondary inflammatory effect that we've all recognized is what leads to this prolonged stay and all the complications that develop in the ICU. And so now when patients are arriving at the hospital, um, we're seeing them extremely early. And if we're seeing their oxygen needs go up rapidly in those first 24 hours, which is what we saw, um, we're intervening. We're getting them plasma right away. We're getting them remdesivir right away. We're giving them tocilizumab if their inflammatory markers are high. We're giving them steroids. And we're not having patients end up in the ICU like we were doing in the beginning. We seem to be stopping the process, um, which has been a dramatic difference for us. Um, everyone that came in during that first four to six weeks, it seemed that they came in, they had one, two, even five or 10 liter oxygen needs or high flow. And within 24 or 48 hours, they were in the ICU on 100% oxygen. And the next thing we know, they were intubated. And the numbers are way down right now, but even the cases that we've seen later on in this course that we kind of changed course in the treatment, including the plasma treatments, it seems to have made a difference that they're not developing this inflammatory state that we can't control anymore. Um, so we are giving it to patients that a definition of severe respiratory failure, but it doesn't mean they have to be on 100% oxygen. It doesn't mean they need to be intubated. We really just look at it as patients that have SATs under 93% that are not on room air. Um, so if they're, you know, come in and they're on a couple liters of oxygen and it's changing, we're giving them the plasma. Um, if they have bilateral infiltrates on their x-rays that are consistent with the COVID, as soon as the diagnosis is confirmed, which with our testing, we can now confirm quite quickly, um, we're able to 
uh, get the plasma for them. It's readily available for all blood types, which was a big barrier for us in the beginning. You know, we had essentially a text chain between the critical care physicians, the ID physicians, and the blood bank of what do you have today? And what are our highest priority of patients who we think are on the steep cliff down and can we get it into them before they go down this cliff? Um, so that was our practice for the first couple of weeks of plasma. And now it's evolved to that we don't even need to have this text chain anymore because we, it's so readily available because the donors have been out there. I uh, totally can relate to that, Dr. Paniko. During those times, in fact, few of the RP uh, physicians who were battling their life uh, being on the ventilators in Ohio specifically, and uh, it's such a good story of hope that uh, that particular physician has recovered and he, she's in the rehab. But, uh, oh boy, I remember the turmoil that all of us kind of, we were helpless because there was so much, number one, where do we get the availability and how they implement. And it is such music to ears to hear that now you don't have to go through all that when you have, it's relatively easy. And uh, thanks to, I guess, all the education, the patients who have recovered and uh, the blood centers, like the New York Blood Center. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Paniko. Now, oh my God, what an excitement now and uh, the utmost honor to introduce uh, the real heroes of our, uh, the duo or of our recovered patient and donor. So a little bit of background, um, um, Hartford Healthcare uh, role with its leadership, outstanding physicians, of course, we have one amongst us now, Dr. Panico, and collaboration with blood banks like Dr. under Dr. Sachai's leadership and others locally. A plasma collection uh, centers have saved many patients. And in fact, uh, Tom happens to be Dr. Panico's patient. And she was, uh, Dr. Panico was Tom's, one of the main physicians and who helped him uh, through his path of um, recovery. And uh, one big round of applause to Tom and Chris. <laughs> And Dr. Panico, of course. <laughs> okay, Tom, you are on now. Uh, uh, Tom, so uh, thank you so much for agreeing to share our ex your experience with all of us. And uh, truly, you are the symbol of hope and success of a good treatment plan. Tom, so in your words, I know that when I had the initial conversation with you to ask, ask you to share your experience, I can never forget what you said. You said, I hardly remember anything because that is how you were, how ill you were. And here you are in front of us. And uh, please share uh, what has been your experience of whatever that you can um, remember about your diagnosis, treatment, and uh, recovery, please. Tom, please. Thank you. And uh, first I'd like to thank Doc Panico and of course, Chris. Um, and talking with my wife, I guess, Doc Kumar, you were uh, a big part of my recovery also, from what I understand. But again, I can't remember myself, so just going on what the wife's telling me. Um, a little background, I'm 51 years old. I was a Hartford fireman for 25 years before I retired, retired a couple years ago, and I was working for myself as a safety inspector on construction sites. A um, couple of my jobs brought me down to St. Vincent, one of your hospitals, and I had a couple of jobs at Hartford Hospital. Actually, one of the jobs I had was converting a floor on the uh, in the Bliss building over to a COVID uh, floor right before I got sick. I'm not saying I got sick at Hartford Hospital, but somewhere along the line, I picked it up. Um, prior to getting ill, I was fairly healthy. Um, my only medical history is history of high cholesterol, and I treat that with exercise and diet. And uh, you know, I try to stay healthy, work out three, four times a week, and I take the dogs for a walk every day. Um, so, with that being said, towards the end of March, um, 
I think it was the uh, beginning of the third week of March, I started to feel a little tired and uh, it just started to progress. Um, a little difficulty breathing and the trees were starting to bud, so I thought it might be my allergies. So I stuck it out a little bit, called my primary doc, maybe 10 days into it. He didn't want to get me tested. He uh, put me on a Z-Pack and a couple inhalers. And, you know, a couple more days went by. Um, kept telling my wife, who's a nurse, that I didn't feel well. And uh, eventually the fever came and the chills came. Um, and then, uh, you know, one morning, it was, I think it was Tuesday morning, April 7th, I woke up and I said, uh, we got to call an ambulance. And this is how small of a community I live in. Um, the police officer that showed up to my house was a friend of my wife's and she's over all the time. Uh, my brother-in-law, who's a fire marshal in town, he showed up and it was an Aetna ambulance and the guy driving the ambulance was a guy I've seen on calls for 20 years. So, um, I, I remember my ride to Hartford Hospital. I remember getting out of the ambulance and my brother who's worked at Hartford Hospital for 35 years, he was waiting for me to get off. And one of my buddies who was a fireman with me, he's working part-time at Hartford Hospital, he was there. And they wheeled me into the ER. I remember them stripping me and asking me some questions. They uh, wheeled me out of the ER and that was it. I. Uh, I think I was out for two, two or three weeks. So I think I was ventilated for two weeks, maybe a little longer. Um, so as far as I know, everyone in the ICU did an awesome job because I'm here. So thank you. Tell your friends, your colleagues, thanks. And um, step down ICU was pretty tough. And Dr. Kumar, you mentioned it. Um, yeah, I feel bad for the nurses that were taking care of me. I know they're going to have some PTSD. Uh, I know this is going to go on my ladder of critical incidents somewhere. I don't know where it's going to pan out, but um, at some time, you know, I'm going to have to figure that out. Uh, spent a couple of days in the step down ICU, and then I went over to I went over to the Conklin Building on. Uh, the fourth floor. And that's really where I started to get my wits about me again and I could start interacting. And I had this uh, PCA, Javier. If any of you guys know Javier, he's a great kid. Um, I think he's like a 19 year old kid, volunteer fireman in Weathersfield. Man, that kid took good care of me. And, uh, you know, I, I got to track him down. I owe him a steak and a beer. And then um, I had this 20 year old girl, Asia, I think her name was. And same thing, she worked every day, seven to seven. And if they asked her to stay, she would stay till 11. What, what a great girl. I know she's going to Southern Connecticut to be a nurse. Um, again, if you guys run into her somewhere, you know, tell her I said, thank you. And man, w without those two, I, the isolation will, drive you crazy um, but you know that that's all I remember of Hartford Hospital I remember them getting me out of there fairly quick like four days um, there and then I then I went down to Gaylord uh, the fire department set a couple trucks over and the guys were all lined up when I got wheeled out of Hartford Hospital that was that was good to see um, some of my buddies you know and then I got down to Gaylord. I was there for about a week. That's when I really started to talk to Doc Panico and she's awesome. So uh, she set me straight, got my head straight. Uh, you know, re rehab was quick down there. They sent me home with some stuff. Unfortunately, outpatient wasn't available. So I've been doing most of my rehab myself. And, you know, I'm glad to say, uh, you know, I was able to go fishing this morning for the first time, uh, take a walk with the wife every night. I'm working out every day, split some firewood uh, 
the other day, you know, I, I, I don't last as long as I used to, you know, I'm 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and then I got to take a rest. But, uh, you know, Chris, I, I didn't forget you, buddy. Uh, thanks for what you did. You know, I, I really appreciate it. And just so you know, and everyone listening knows, uh, I got a wife who's a nurse. I have five kids. Two of them are going off to college this year. Um, going to get to see them graduate. Going to be able to watch my oldest play college football at Cornell. So, you know, um, I know, Doc, you, you said I was a hero a couple of times, and not not this time around. I, I just laid there. You guys did everything. And I got I to gotta just say thanks again. If it was not a webinar, I would have cried. Oh, I'm Shamelessly, crying. Shamelessly, I would have cried. <laughs> I'm crying, so I, I, I think I'm crying inside with happiness, but oh my God, <laughs> thanks so much. Uh, Dr. Paniku, we are going to round back to you after I talk to Chris. Uh, Chris, now the spotlight is on you, sir, because you made this possible. Mm? So uh, the plasma therapy as a supportive treatment would not have been possible without our donors like Chris who have uh, donated their plasma to help patients. Chris, can you please share uh, your own recovery experience and the process of you learning about what is this about the plasma donation and what were the logistics and what did you feel when you in fact, heard from Tom uh, that a patient recovered through. Patients did get support from other treatments, but probably your plasma did play a good significant role too uh, with the one of the treatments. So please, Chris, share your thoughts, please. Sure. Um, I developed COVID in early March, uh, same as uh, TJ, they initially thought it was the flu, um, despite um, me already having the flu back in January. Um, so I didn't actually get tested until my symptoms had resolved. Thankfully, they weren't um, too severe. It was um, kind of an intense flu. Um, but other than that, certainly not as um, severe as many other people. Um, but once it was the test came back positive it was you know quarantining for two weeks um it was during that time that one of the one of my colleagues uh texted me and just let me know about this experimental program in new york where they were collecting blood plasma and um i think it was still a trial at that point in trying to administer it to patients um, so I did fill out, there was like an online web form. I, I thought it would be interesting and, you know, having gone through it, I was like, if there's anything I can do to help, you know, I'm all for it. So I signed up for that. Um, they called me pretty soon after and, um, wanted me to go to Rochester, New York to donate. Um, before I did though, they needed me to go to, uh, get a type and screen but the closest place they had was um, right on the border of New York in Connecticut. So I went there, but um, there were some definitely some logistical challenges in the beginning as everybody was working things out. I was one of the first donors they were working with from Connecticut. Um, so it was already about an hour drive just to the type and screen. And then when I got there, they weren't, admit me into the building because I didn't have a negative COVID screening. Um, so I had a positive test result, but because I didn't have a negative test result yet, they just weren't allowing anyone into the building who had had COVID unless they had a negative test result. Um, so they ended up kind of turning me away and then asking if I could come back the following week. Um, and that's when I, I kind of thought, you know, I haven't actually checked with my own healthcare system that I work at to see if they're offering anything similar yet. Um, so I did reach out to our COVID hotline. And at the time they said they were still starting to work something out, but didn't have anything yet. Um, 
a little bit of background. Both my parents actually work at Hartford Healthcare as well. Um, my father in transplant, my mother is an ICU nurse. Um, so my father knew a few of the people in infectious disease that he talked to and actually found out that they were just about ready to start the plasma donation program um, like two days after I had inquired. So they, he put me in touch with them and uh, I told them I was interested. And so they said I would be first on the list. And then sure enough, two days later, they gave me a call. Um, at the time they said that the only place that they were working or contracted with was Rhode Island Blood Center, um, which was fine. So, you know, I drove up there and the experience was, was really pretty painless. Um, I was expecting it to be more involved than it was, to be honest. It was, you know, a quick um, couple of tests just to make sure I was healthy. And then they hooked me up to the plasmapheresis machine for about an hour. I didn't really experience any kind of side effects. I thought it'd be kind of like donating blood where you'd feel weak or lightheaded afterwards, but um, with the plasma phreasis, um, it really didn't have that effect. So afterwards I felt fine. You know, they made me sit and have snacks and drink fluids and the kind of stuff, but um, I really didn't need it because I felt perfectly fine. Um, you know, so your arm feels a little cold when they're infusing, but other than that, it was really pretty painless. So I know everybody keeps um, you know, calling me a hero and saying I did all these amazing things, but to me, it was really, you know, a couple hours of my time. So I'm, you know, extremely glad to hear from, from you, TJ, and, you know, from others who have gotten plasma that it, it actually made a difference because it was still seemed kind of experimental at the time. But I mean, it, it was really a small, small gesture on my part, and I'm glad it, you know, it had such an effect for you. But it's really the nurses, the doctors, you know, who are, who are the real heroes and actually taking a risk. Um, so thank you to, to everyone on the call who's out there on the front lines. Thank you, Chris. Even though you are not ready to, yes, you are a hero. Yes, we are. You can't deny that. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much for all what you did. Dr. Panika, now going back to you, where in Tom's journey did you intercept his clinical course in such a positive way using Chris Plasma? Do you remember? Yeah, so as Tom said, he was intubated for about two weeks um, at the hospital. Um, and as I had described to you earlier, um, we had essentially given him all the treatments that we had available, and we were just waiting. We were proning him 16 hours a day. Um, he was still on high levels of oxygen. He wasn't improving. We were working with hospital leadership every day to see when plasma was going to be available. Um, and fortunately, um, on day 11 of his stay, was when he got the plasma. So it became available. He was our first patient to get it. Um, and four days later is when we were able to extubate him. Um, and so time-wise, uh, it, it definitely seemed to play a part. Um, and we went, you know, from seeing someone like him who, you know, couldn't move, who was fully dependent on the respiratory, fail uh, respiratory machine, in multi-organ failure um, to having the privilege um, of seeing him uh, improve and get better. And I've had the very unique opportunity during this whole crisis to be able to watch people like Tom go from this state of where we did not think that they were gonna survive. Um, we were just waiting two and three and four weeks to watching them walk out the door to go home um, in the arms of their loved ones. And that has just completely changed um, many people's perspective on this, mine included, that, you know, we can fight this. We have tools now. Plasma is one of them. Um, and I think we're in a much better position now, if God forbid that we have to deal with this again, that I'm hoping that we don't have another large group of patients like Tom. Um, and he paved the way for us. They, as much as they went through such a horrible thing. We've learned so much from them and I'm so happy to see them doing well on the other side and hearing about how 
they're living a normal life again. Um, and we will check his lung function, make sure that it's normal and that he's going to get back to everything um, he wants to do. Um, but I, I think we have the right treatments now. I hope that we have more in the future. Um, and hopefully we have no one in the ICU at some point in time that's fighting COVID. Thank you. Now, uh, all this, yes, we are all in this together, but a huge part was played by uh, blood centers like New York Blood Center. So let me hand over uh, the uh, uh, moderator uh, role to Dr. Rupak Devan. To kindly introduce Dr. Sachais, please, and uh, uh, take it from here. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Um, it is my absolute privilege to introduce Dr. Bruce Sakis. He is the chief medical officer for the New York Blood Center. Um, the New York Blood Center is one of the largest community blood collection uh, distribution organizations in the country. Hello? Oh, there you are. Okay. Yeah, just, just wanted to make sure. Yeah. The, the, um, it is uh, one of the largest um, community blood collection and distribution uh, centers in the, in the entire country. They've done a tremendous job um, in supporting the patients, uh, patient community, and they were critical um, being at the epicenter of this crisis. Um, they were way ahead of the game. In talking to Dr. Gorosu, she had shared experiences where she personally had worked with uh, the New York uh, Blood Center. And the impact that they had in being able to distribute um, the convalescent plasma to even local hospitals. Um, this was important. We personally, being part of the committee, um, had worked together to try to get convalescent plasma to key board members and um, you know, our own physician members of API. And so uh, this was a critical process. Um, so the hope is that, um, Dr. Sakis, you could share uh, your vision and experience in terms of uh, the process. And the hope is that the workflow that you're going to share with us or your experience will help set a precedence um, if this is needed or um, if this is ever to occur again. Um, so please, uh, eager to hear your experience. So thank you so much for having me here and giving me the opportunity. And thank you, TJ, for sharing your story as a patient. Um, I don't get to hear a lot of those, and it's really, it's really heartwarming for me. And Chris, you are a hero because if we don't have people like you who went through the COVID experience and then had the bravery to come into our centers and donate plasma when there was a, still a lot of unknowns, especially early on when you donated about that experience, uh, we would not be here today and we would not have been able to make the impact that, that we've been able to make. So don't underestimate what you've done when you walk into the blood center. So I think this is stuff that everyone's already heard. Early on in March, we realized that the New York area was uh, an epicenter of the pandemic. And there was some information about convalescent plasma. And, you know, so we, we didn't have a lot of data. We had a few reports from other countries. There were maybe about 15 patients worth. We had a little bit of evidence that the virus might clear more quickly if we had uh, used some plasma and uh, evidence of some rapid improvement, but it was really very limited and very weak data. But because there was nothing really else and nothing disease specific, there was a lot of interest in this. And we at the blood center realized that if we're gonna make an impact, on this pandemic, this is where we could do it because this is our expertise in collecting patients and qualifying donors and all of these things, working with the FDA to be able to provide an investigation. We started really early on in the anticipation that this could be an important thing. Um, so we began conversations with several hospitals in the area uh, and also some, some hospitals nationally. You heard about Mayo and maybe Hopkins or other epicenters of interest. For, for studies and we wanted to support uh, all of those efforts and that's part of the reason we got so involved early on as well. So I think everyone knows convalescent plasma is basically passive immunity. If you have someone who's gotten better from an infection like COVID-19, they're likely to have some neutralizing or helpful antibodies because they got better and we want to hopefully they're still circulating so we can take them out of the, the recovered patient and give them to someone who's currently suffering because at that point we, we hope that those antibodies might do something helpful and the things they might do and we didn't really know this at the time are increase the viral clearance improve clinical sy the symptoms 
uh, and help patients get better faster. But we also had the fear, because this has been described for other viruses, that we could exacerbate symptoms because of the immune reaction and the way that works. Of course, is if you're giving a lot more antibody, the immune system may have more triggers and may ramp up really quickly. And we now know that that's not the case for the antibody, but it certainly is for the disease. And so we got lucky in a sense that these antibodies that we were giving were appear to be helpful and they don't appear to be harmful from any of the published reports as of yet. Um, so, and then there's also studies that are now starting to happen to see if we can protect people from getting infected or, or in the first place, and if they have mild symptoms, not getting severe symptoms. And, and just at the bottom here, I have CCP is the, the an acronym we use for COVID convalescent positive. So we took a very proactive approach to the blood center for the reasons that I've already described, anticipating that there could be value to patients, but there was a lot of uncertainty. But we really felt we had no choice but to dive in head first and to, and to figure out how to collect this product so that if it was helpful, it was there. And if it wasn't helpful, well, then it wasn't helpful. But we wanted to make sure it was available because so many people had interest in it and there was such a great need for something. So our goals in setting up the program were to start very quickly because the need was already here, even though we were proactive. Plan for rapid expansion and always focusing on both donor and patient safety and watching very closely and getting as much data as we could, uh, descriptive or, or actual published data to, to know what this product was doing. And so we had a phased approach. Uh, we felt if we waited till we had all of our ducks in a row to make a perfect program, it would be too late. We didn't want to do that. So these are a list of many of the issues and challenges, and I'll touch on most of them and go into a couple in a little detail. Uh, if I was asked, qualification of the donors and the FDA criteria for what you needed to have to be able to accept someone as a convalescent donor uh, were some of the biggest challenges, and they were very rapidly evolving. And I think, Chris, that's what you were mentioning when you talked about being turned away because of the negative test, which was early on a criteria, but data came out that suggested that wasn't important. Uh, and, and that test wasn't actually helpful, and so we were able to change what we did and then help the FDA change over time. So that's not now a criteria for most of these. Uh, but early on, we didn't know, and everyone wanted to be extra careful. Recruitment of the donors. So how do we get don how do we identify patients who are recovered from COVID uh, and and who do meet the criteria that I'll lay out to, to be a COVID plasma donor? How do we schedule all these donors? We do schedule donors all the time because there's a massive outpouring of the community in the second, third, and fourth weeks of the program because there were a lot of people that were recovered and wanted to come help, which was also very heartwarming um, and, and an incredible example of the positive ways that humans respond to crisis. Uh, so that was one of the things that kept me going during all of the, the, the struggles and, and, and negativity of the time. Uh, how do we actually collect enough of this stuff and, and move resources around, how does this product need to be labeled, which you know, you, really our issue, we have to make sure it's labeled right so that the FDA is happy and you know when you look at a bag what you're actually getting and how do we distribute it. And that changed, all of these things changed throughout the time. So I'll spend a little bit on qualification of donors because this is really upfront what we had to figure out. And in the beginning, we had to have evidence that the COVID-19 was diagnosed by a laboratory test, usually nasal swab, um, but eventually antibodies are possible as well to show. There were lots of people that swore that they had COVID-19 by symptoms, and some of them were right, and many of them were not right based on later testing. So um, clinically, you can't tell for sure. You needed complete resolution of symptoms for 28 days prior to donation, or you had to have at least 14 days of resolution of symptoms and have this negative testing that we heard about. But we had been working with one of the hospitals in New York City who had data from many of the, their patients and some of the potential donors as well as New York State data that suggested that this test was not a useful prognostic test. So it was a good diagnostic test, but to follow when somebody would still be infectious, it was not doing that job. And so many people would test positive and they were not deemed infectious. Many people would test negative and it didn't necessarily mean that they were completely non-infectious. So the timing seemed to be better than the testing. And so we were allowed 
first by a waiver from the FDA that we applied for, and then later the FDA changed the rules based on the data we provided to not have to do that follow-up testing to show a negative swab. And that got rid of the 28 days. So now patients who had recovered were well for at least 14 days were technically eligible to come in and donate. And that really opened up the pool and simplified the process. Early on, as I'll show you, we had to have hospitals qualify donors because we couldn't do this testing. And there was actually very little testing available. And, 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 and you heard some of the doctors talk about the limited testing that was available in these early days. As this became easier to qualify donors with, with less testing, we were able to then bring people in directly through the blood center and expand out to Rhode Island, down to Delaware and other places where we have the blood center. So all this is happening simultaneously. Um, but, but again, it was the first phase and then the second phase that I'll talk about. Trolley mitigation, trolley for those who don't know is transfusion associated acute lung injury and plasma is an offender of that. If there are certain types of antibodies called HLA antibodies in plasma, it can bind to molecules in a, in a recipient and cause lung problems. And we don't want to do that to anyone, but especially someone with a lung disease. So we made sure that all of the plasma went through our trolley mitigation, which means had to be male or never pregnant females. Some blood centers were arguing about whether or not they should take ever pregnant females and we decided we were taking everybody. We held the blood until we got the testing done because we can test to these antibodies and about 10% of the ever pregnant females did have antibodies and we put them aside and they're not allowed to be used for transfusion. We can do other things with those. So we collected blood that we can't use for, for patients at the moment, but we felt that that was the more efficient way to do it rather than to test people and then wait and tell them to come back the second day to donate after we got the test results. We didn't think that was fair to people, especially those who've spent a lot of time in hospitals recently. So, um, so this is the approach that we took. We also had to a potential requirement or it was really a recommendation to, me to measure the antibodies in the plasma. Pla convalescent plasma doesn't do somebody any good if there's no antiviral antibodies in there. And I'm not going to go into the details of neutralizing antibodies. I think most people on the call understand that those are really hard to measure, especially early on, they were impossible to measure. Um, so we have saved samples on all of these, and I'll talk a little so that they can be measured in the future. And we actually uh, will go through what testing we did do in a, in, a, in a future slide. So this is the labeling, which everyone is probably uninterested in, but I do want to point out a few things. Um, so that you know what the labels say. So it has to say convalescent plasma and what antibody is in the plasma. And based on our criteria for qualifying donors, we were allowed to, to go ahead and label it that way. And this number here is an ISBT code. And those codes had to be generated as an international code. And there's a different code for each different type of convalescent plasma. So if it comes from different collection technologies, these numbers are different. So that those details aren't important for this audience, but those are just example of one of the other types of regulatory hurdles we had to, we had to overcome and understand. And we had to then put this into the computer system and make sure that the labels printed properly and, and all of these kind of things, which, which are all doable, but they all take time. And, and so we had to find ways to do this much more quickly than we normally do. So we, this is a matter of days to implement this when it usually takes weeks to a month. And we did that with resource focus. And then we had to say that this is an investigation, a new drug, and it's an investigational because this can only be given under some sort of IND. Uh, and that's what we see today. So this is a complicated slide, and I'm not going to go through all the details, but I'll use it to describe some of the things that are different from our phase one and our phase two. And we started phase one first. And phase one was when we had to do all this testing that I talked to you about, where you had to show that the patient had recovered, so they had not only a positive nasal swab, but they later had negative nasal swabs. And we weren't sure what we had to do for antibody testing, so we actually were testing initially to make sure that there was at least some antibody present against the virus. Uh, and so we had to have hospital partners for that because we had not brought up any tests on our own. We were focused on the collection, and we even didn't know who all the patients were at this point. So it was really critical early on that hospitals identify donors. And then what we did early on is if you sent, we had a, a process by which if you identified a donor and qualified them, that plasma would go back to your hospital, not to a specific patient, but back to that hospital. As we got 
our feet wet and knew what was going on and we were able to change the criteria a bit, we went into phase two where we were able to recruit directly at the blood center and we set up websites and, and processes to collect data from patients so we can qualify them on our own with the 14 day symptom free and documentation of a positive diagnostic COVID test. Uh, we also had a variety of community groups and I'll list some of those on the, on the last page as well as other hospitals that were helping us to do recruiting. There was The state was helping with certain testing. Um, so we had a huge number of organizations, public and private, that were helping us to identify donors and get them in. Um, and during that time, all of that plasma was available to any hospital that was able to order from New York Blood. And so we also, you know, normally it's a challenge if you're not one of our customers to order, but what we did was we set up information on the website and had our customer service reps available uh, pretty much 24 seven so that if you were not a customer of New York Blood, but were in an area where we could deliver you blood physically, you could fill out a couple of simple forms and we'd be able to have you order blood uh, w within a day or so of filling out those forms so that we didn't have to uh, pick and choose and, and, and deny any hospital the access to the plasma. Uh, so all, again, all these things are happening at once and it took a, a huge uh, effort and coordination to do this. So as you can imagine, about 80% of what we did for three to four weeks was COVID plasma because that's what the patients in the, in the area and in the country needed. Uh, so that's where our focus went. In order to scale up collection, uh, and you heard this earlier on from Dr. Kumar, we had to redistribute or repurpose the workforce. We also were looking at potentially furloughing many employees because our mobile blood sites, our mobile drives were stopping. One, because they were usually at places of work and there were places people were not going to work, but also we couldn't ensure the safety. Uh, I didn't talk about what we're doing in the blood centers to ensure safety, but we're putting in the same we put in the same safety things that you have in the hospitals as far as questions and fevers and, and, and you know, only letting certain people in. So we couldn't really do that early on at the mobile blood drive, so we stopped that. Our blood, blood collection for standard blood products went way down, but because the hospitals were mostly caring for COVID patients, the need went down as well. And the main need in the hospitals was for the convalescent plasma, and so that's where we moved all our resources. So we didn't furlough people. Um, and we retrain those that could to, to call and schedule donors, or they would look at the intake forms that we had donors putting in to see if they really qualified or didn't qualify to be a convalescent plasma donor, and maybe they could be a regular blood donor, and so doing all those kinds of things. Uh, we also had the workers, the, the phlebotomists uh, and nurses who were at the mobile drive would be at the fixed sites, and we used a lot of our Ephoresis equipment, which is used for multiple things, and the vast majority of it went toward collection of convalescent plasma. So that is when I show you the ramp up, all of these things were being done so that we could focus on collection of convalescent plasma, which was the main patient need at the time. New York City, of course, is the main focus in, in, in that region. And as you heard, RIBC, uh, Rhode Island Blood Center up in Rhode Island was one of, these are all of our affiliates. And so once we got things settled in and our processes in place in New York, we shared all of our processes with our affiliates and rolled it out in Delaware first and shortly after that Rhode Island and then out in the Midwest at our blood centers there so that all the blood centers could be collecting the plasma. We also um, shared all of what we were doing with a variety of groups, including the American Association of the Blood Bank, America's Blood Centers and the American Red Cross all had access to what we were doing. None of it was meant to be secret or proprietary. It was all meant to be shared and they could take it and adopt it and use it to hopefully set up their processes more quickly. To be able to so I was asked how much did we collect and this is a graph of that. So fortunately we have a really nice um, informatics system now that collects our data. And so mid-March on the week beginning March 22nd, we started and we had seven units that we collected and they were all immediately distributed to patients. By the second week, you can see we're in the 70s. The third week, the fourth week, by the fifth week, we were collecting over 3,000 units of convalescent plasma. And for, for about a month or so, we've been collecting around 4,000. Um, and, and now we're starting to come down a little bit, but there's still a lot of plasma that we're collecting. 
and the red represents what we've distributed. So that lags behind a little bit, which means we have a stockpile uh, of plasma that we still have available for distribution. So right now, this is, so here, this was a scarce resource. It was almost impossible to get it to anybody and people were using it as quickly as we could make it. As we got here, it really became here to here. We're talking about something that maybe isn't readily available, but pretty, pretty easily, pretty easy to get for your sicker patients. And then once we got to here, then it became easier to start giving it to patients who weren't as sick. And, and, and as we heard from Dr. Nico and others, that um, those patients really benefit greatly from it. And the goal now that we have all the plasma available is to get it to patients earlier and the data supports those patients do well. Uh, the earlier we can get it to them, the better, and that makes sense for what we now know about the disease. So, so far, these numbers actually have gone up since I made the slide a few days ago, more like 18,000 units and 31,000 units. Uh, so, um, clearly a very successful program as far as production, and fortunately, the, the data, the stories that you're hearing at this meeting are echoed in the literature um, that that there is benefit from the convalescent plasma. I'm running a little bit behind, so I'll try to do this quickly, but this is just sort of evolution of, of the program, and it kind of goes into some of the things that you've been talking about. Where do we go from here? This is the evolution of the testing. So the first antibody testing that we had was all done by New York State and their assay, and then we were able to eventually set up in-house assays, so now we can do our own assays. Um, the bottom line is when we've been able to test our units in the criteria of 14 days without the retesting, we found that 95% of the units that we collected had detectable antibodies. The other 5% we're not using, and they may or may not have antibodies in them because each test is a little bit different and we don't know exactly what the right test is. But if we don't detect by using, we actually use two different assays if we get a negative result. On one assay, we'll check with the second assay. If both assays are negative, we just assume there's nothing useful there and we put the, put the unit aside. Uh, but that early on, we were giving out everything because that's what we had to do. We couldn't test and people needed the plasma. But I'm happy to report that about 95 to 97% of those units really did have antibodies of high enough level that we, we think that they would be helpful. Um, our technology, we talked a little bit about how we you know, with our technology, first using what was already at our fixed sites and then taking equipment that was out for mobile uh, and bringing it into the fixed sites while, while trying to maintain social distancing and all of that, which we were able to fortunately balance. Um, the distribution, first it was really to the hospitals in phase one that were qualifying donors, then it was to all hospitals we could get the plasma to and now it's really national for anyone across the country for the last month or so that can't get plasma from their local blood supplier, we can supply it to them. And there, there are distribution systems. So they don't necessarily have to call us, they can call a clearinghouse and that clearinghouse lets us know, hey, we need five units of O plasma, do you have it? And, and we can ship it off. And then the products, um, again, it was the, the regional and national first for the plasma. We now have a stockpile and some of that stockpile will be used because unfortunately there are still cases and there may be a little bit of a rise with some of the reopenings here and across the country and we are seeing that in, in many states. But hyperimmune globulin hasn't really been talked about and so there are plasma manufacturers that routinely create uh, concentrated versions of antibodies and other plasma proteins and we're working with them to help them to manufacture and test hyperimmune globulins, because then you can put the antibodies in a bottle, biophilize it, stick it in the refrigerator in a pharmacy, and then it's even more available. And it's also going to be more consistent because you can assay the lots and you can have a more consistent product that you're giving to your patient. And then the, the last slide is really the thank you. And there's not thank enough room you. to put thanks for everybody. Um, thank but we really had lots of people involved in this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so, Bruce, since 8 a.m., I was trying to remind you, but when I was looking at the questions, you were already answering most of the questions to your slides. So let me please hand over the podium now to Dr. Arupak Devan, because at 8.25, we have to close up because there's another um, seminar that starts. Arupak, can you please cover the Q&A, please?
Yes, absolutely. I mean, we've had some great questions. Uh, Dr. Sakis, I think uh, some of the questions that were asked, you've already addressed in, uh, in, in going through your slides. Um, so that, that worked out well. Um, a couple of questions uh, that I wanted to highlight. Uh, we have one from Dr. Usha Sri uh, Chamarthi from, um, she's a he monk from Michigan. Um, the question is, are sample aliquots from the plasma donor as well as the recipient being stored as part of any registry for future research or analysis? Dr. Sakis. So on the blood center side for all of the donors, we are keeping samples and we're doing it one because we wanted to know what the antibodies look like in those samples. But also uh, there's a, the FDA has asked us to, to measure these antibodies after the fact if we don't prospectively measure them. Uh, and there's a lot of important things we can learn, uh, mandated or not, by measuring the antibodies in a variety of neutralizing and ELISA assays. One thing we want to know, of course, is the distribution of, of the antibodies and types of antibodies in, in various patients uh, and donors. The other is how long do the antibodies last? One thing I didn't mention is we implemented a variance. We got a variance for the FDA to be able to collect these patients' donors weekly up to eight times when normally a regular plasma donor can only donate once every four weeks. And based on data that we had from other experiences, we were able to demonstrate to the FDA that we felt that was safe and they agreed as long as we didn't do it forever and just limited it to eight, eight collections. And so we have samples that we can start analyzing if people come week after week after week, what happens to their antibody levels and, and in different assays and things like that. Uh, I can't really talk a lot about the patients. I know that there are national efforts to look at both donors and patients, including some funded by the NIH that we're participating in, as well as to look at the RNA in blood. Uh, we know it can be found, but we think that it's not infectious and it's very low. And so we're able to do surveys of, of not only antibodies, but also of, of RNA from the virus in normal healthy people, as well as recovered patients. Thank you. Um, how about on the hospital side, um, Dr. Kumar? You know, it's a great question, and I'm trying to remember are we saving any aliquots or not. Um, I, I can't tell you that the hospital system is doing it or not, quite frankly. I think we have a COVID registry, so we're collecting a fair amount of data at the moment um, on, on a variety of areas, but saving the aliquot is a great question. I really don't know that we're doing it right. Okay, great. Um, we have a question for Dr. Sakis from uh, Dr. Nick Nickham from Houston, Texas. Uh, a couple questions, some were answered already, um, but um, one question is, how close are we to using uh, concentrated IgG antibodies? Uh, another question, um, part of that is, what is the optimal time for administering plasma, and how many units um, are most people getting or, or do they need to, to see a, a change? So I know that for the concentrated antibody, that there are, are multiple plasma manufacturers that have actually formed a consortium, again, in the spirit of cooperation. They're normally competitors of each other, and they're working together to create a uniform product. Um, I'm hoping that that might be available in, in a matter of months, but I don't really have a lot of information on the timeline. And we are contributing some units because we have so many. We are contributing some units to that as well as their, they collect plasma as well as at their own plasma centers, and they're trying to collect uh, convalescent donors as well. Um, the amount of plasma that's given, uh, and, and you know, maybe Dr. Kaniko can, can comment as well, is typically one to two units, uh, depending on the protocol and, and the timing, as you heard, I think the earlier is better is what we know now, but we didn't know that early on. Yeah. Dr. Banico, yeah, please, if you could add to that. Sure. So we're giving two units as part of the Mayo protocol um, within 12 hours of each other. And again, the earlier is the better. We weren't able to do that in the beginning just because the number right. we see now, um, but we're giving it within 24 hours um, of their coming in if we have a positive test. Um, and so that, that's the key right now. So earlier is better before they develop severe respiratory failure and go down this inflammatory pathway. What is the time interval, Megan, between the first and the second unit? Do you wait a couple of days? No, it's usually within the first, they're given kind of right after each other within 12 hours. Great. 
another question we do have um, trying to see. We have one from Dr. Ravi uh, Tamarisia, um, anesthesiologist in Houston. Um, general question, wh you know, when was the seriousness of the COVID infection first recognized in terms of it, this being, uh, you know, a serious infection that we needed to, you know, uh, tackle right away? Um, you know, is there anything that could have been done back at the beginning to lessen the impact? Um, Madhuri, should I just address and I think other members I think you should address, well. Ajay, yes. Thank you. So uh, I, I think from uh, in January, we realized, at least in the U.S., uh, that uh, the contagiousness of this disease and how fast it was spreading um, uh, in the U.S., I think we, we were, uh, at least in Hartford Healthcare, we began to pay attention sometime in mid-January. Um, I think in December, as you know, in China and Wuhan, it was noticed that it was a, there was an outbreak and it was rapidly spreading. I think the second question is really important, eh? uh, what you could have done differently. Uh, and I think just to give you some stats here, uh, Connecticut is a 3.2 um, 3, uh, million uh, population. We've seen more than 4,000 mortality here. 52% are in the nursing home in the SNF um, um, environment. So if, if you go back in time, what we lacked at the time is a rapid tasting. And any epidemiological behavior, when you think about the pandemic as it spreads, uh, if the R naught is higher than two uh, or one, actually, and it was 2.3 or 2.45 uh, in this particular case, what we did not have the rapid testing, what we did not have the rapid isolation going forward. So many of the states actually are behind the curve, it's still within the first wave. I think the think about is that how do you optimize your testing? How do you make sure you create an isolation protocol, contact tracing? We believe we could have saved a lot of lives. That's one area by just testing and implementing the social distancing and reducing the odd not to around one or something like that. The second part is the population, uh, the vulnerable population. As it's indicated, the 52% of individuals who are, at least in Connecticut, the mortality has been the SNP and assisted living individuals. We needed a better protocol of uh, infection prevention, the wisdom policy, the restriction of um, the movement of the healthcare workers from different area. Um, and I think these are the few things we could have done differently to save uh, the mortality we've had. And I think that one of the concerns I have, at least uh, in some of the states in, uh, in our country, who are really not quite there in optimizing those capabilities, despite our having knowledge. Uh, and that's why we're going to continue to see more mortality and suffering as we go forward. Um, we have another question for, for Dr. Panico. Um, Dr. Panico, uh, from the time that you administer the plasma, when do you start seeing a change um, in the patient's uh, status? So I think it's, I think our numbers, I mean, we need to look at the overall numbers. I believe there's over 28,000 patients now in the Mayo study. Um, you know, now that we're delivering it so early, I feel like we're seeing change very early because we're not seeing these patients end up in the ICU. So you know, within 12 hours, we're seeing people wow. better. Early on, I think it was much harder to see because we were giving it so much later. Um, and so now I think the fact that not as many patients are ending up in the ICU, uh, it, it's almost an immediate effect, which is really what you should see. You should see it neutralizing, hopefully, the virus and not leading to an inflammatory response. Rupert, I yes. think we need to uh, start uh, <laughs> Uh, closing this. I'm going Absolutely. to send my email. Uh, any questions, please? I will be more than happy to relate to these awesome speakers because at um, 8.30 we'll be starting the other uh, very important session. So um, either Dr. Seema Arora or Dr. Reddy, can you please uh, do the honor of vote of thanks, please? Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Madhavi. Thank you, Rupak, uh, for doing an amazing job as moderators. And a special thanks to Dr. Paniku, Dr. Kumar, and Dr. Sakis. And uh, thank you for uh, uh, spending your time here, uh, your evening hours, uh, family time with uh, the rest of our physician community and sharing your experiences. And absolute thank you and uh, uh, our uh, salutations to all the patients who suffered this and uh, who have uh, given the come and uh, 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 try to help the remainder of the mankind or humankind. Thank you so much. Thank you all. And, uh, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll have continue these sessions and hopefully uh, we are uh, close to uh,
controlling this disease we still not there yet but uh, hopefully in the next one month two months hopefully we'll be able to find a vaccine or cure and uh, uh, thank you so much thank you dr reddy thank, thank, thank you all right thank you